All right, everyone. Well, thank you for staying with us for our update extra. We definitely have a great lineup for your discussion on advancing alternate fuel corridors. Bonnie, if we can bring up those slides real quick, I'm just gonna give a little context on why this conversation is so important and related to the work that CalSTART has been doing on advancing alternate fuel corridors. Thank you, Bonnie. All right, so CalSTART, since I would say I know I have my friend Abby Swain from EPA Region 1 on the phone here. Uh, we've been working on advancing alternate fuel corridors since 2014 uh, with the start of our Northeast Clean Freight Corridor Initiative in partnership with the Northeast Diesel Collaborative. And then you heard our presentation today working in partnership with John Mikulin at EPA Region 9 on the West Coast Collaborative Alternative Fuel Infrastructure Corridor Coalition, really looking at how we can advance medium and heavy duty clean transportation along our transportation transportation corridors and how we need to be strategic in providing investments, working with partnerships and identifying gaps on how we can really build out those alternate field corridors. Next slide. CalSTART has also had the pleasure of working with the Federal Highway Administration on hosting alternative fuel corridor convenings throughout, throughout the country. This has been a great opportunity to bring multiple states together, state agencies, including transportation, energy and environment offices, bringing utilities, industry, fleets, clean city coalitions, talking about what do we need to do to work as partners to advance alternative fuel corridors. This was an important opportunity for us to really identify what are the big barriers, what's holding us back, and what do we need to do to move clean corridors forward. And certainly we saw from our poll today that funding and incentives is absolutely critical. That is one of our biggest gaps. And so we'll get into talking about why that's so important and why we need to continue to seek out incentives to really help us promote clean corridors. Next slide. And you can see here, this is all of the members that have signed on to our Clean Corridor campaign for federal funding program that would support $300 million ultimately a year for five years. So we're really hoping that we can work with our member companies to seek additional funding to support growing out our national alternative fuel corridors. So now let's get into our discussion and I'm really pleased to introduce our three great clean corridor partners who have been working with us over the years and are championing for their companies how they can play an important role in advancing alternative fuel corridors. So let me introduce our partners and then I'm gonna ask them to turn on their video cam so we can see them. But first we have our friend Gavin Redder, who is the general manager for renewable natural gas for Trillium CNG, which is a loves company. Then we have David Biakov, who is the vice president of government affairs, legislative and regulatory council with the National Association of Truck Stop Operators. And then we have our friend Kevin George Miller, who is a policy director for ChargePoint. Welcome my friends, please turn on your cameras and let's go ahead and get to work here. Great, nice to see you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. And we wanna keep this as interactive and lively as possible. So my friends and participants who've called in today, please get your questions in the question box. Um, we also might wanna turn off your mute mic and have you participate real time with us. But first to start off the conversation, I would love to hear from each of you if you can share why is it important that we advance alternative fuel corridors? So uh, thanks, Alicia. I'll, this is Gavin. I'll uh, I'll take the first crack at, at at that question. You know, if if you're looking to to optimize alternative fuels penetration, you need for customers to have the refueling experience that that they demand, uh, and that's in terms of access, that's in terms of economics, and that's in terms of of the optimal experience. So the Alternative Fuels uh, Corridor uh, program is a, is a critical step towards, towards providing customers with the choice that they require across a range of different fuels. Great, great answer. Thank you, Gavin. Kevin, what do you, what do you say? Great, thanks. Um, you know, I think that we have been at this for a while and uh, we've made significant progress already in modernizing uh, transportation infrastructure. 
We see that uh, charging where people spend most of their time at home and at work, you know, is there and it's growing rapidly. Uh, where people live, work and play around towns and in communities is established, but you know, more is definitely needed. And there is a significant opportunity when we look at fast charging, when we look at long distance corridor uh, infrastructure, uh, when we think about uh, you know, a kind of hub and spoke approach to making sure that all communities across the country are covered and connected. We've got millions of new EVs uh, coming um, into the market from passenger to commercial fleet and other types of public vehicles uh, in the next year or so uh, and more on the way. So we need to make sure that we've got the infrastructure in place now uh, to meet that coast to coast need uh, and to de uh, develop and deliver a, you know, a world-class uh, fueling infrastructure network. Great, thank you so much, Kevin. And David from, Representing all of the members, uh, your truck stop operators, you know, why is this important to, to NASO? Uh, so, so thank you for having us. And I want to compliment you all on, on a, a very uh, seamless, smooth transition to Zoom. You are organizing a Zoom conference here that I thought has been really um, enjoyable to, to just watch as a, as a viewer. Uh, and and as an employee of NASA, where we've tried to make that transition too with a little bit more speed bumps than apparently you've hit, I'm particularly envious. So thank you for having us. Thank um, you, David. Uh, I, I, I would say that, that, you know, from the perspective of the fuel retailer, we are agnostic about the fuel that we sell. Uh, so to, to the extent that there is a policy objective um, to, to shift and displace petroleum-based fuel with alternatives that have more favorable emissions characteristics, I think that we want to be a part of that discussion. And I, and I would say that one of the things that will prompt the private sector to make the investments that a lot of folks want them to make in, these, in this space um, is to create both a demand for the fuel, and I think that, that to have a sufficient demand, you need to to be confident that you'll be able to get to wherever you want to go around the country as smoothly and seamlessly and as economically as you can now. Um, so to the extent things are moving in that direction, uh, I think it's very important that we, that we identify corridors that, that are reliable um, uh, paths through which consumers can move from one place to another. I think that will build more demand, which would enhance the investment. Uh, and, and, and again, um, I, I think that the travel center industry in particular is, is well suited to be a meaningful, um, uh, to play a meaningful role there just the way they have with ethanol and biodiesel for the last 15 years, uh, where, you know, although it's a different fuel, it, the objectives that those, that those policymakers and that, that industry had 15 years ago for what they want the world to look like now is quite similar to what to what you all would like the world to look like 15 years from now. And, and we were a meaningful participant in that transition. And, and, and I think that we can be a meaningful participant in, in the next one. Absolutely. Well, that's great, David. Thank you so much for that great answer. Uh, I want to ask about your partnership. Uh, what I find is so impressive, and as I've been communicating and coordinating with you guys over the years, just how you, the three companies, have come together and really have supported and been an important voice for advancing alternative fuel corridors. Maybe, Kevin, I'll go to you. I, I saw this great announcement a while back on NASO and ChargePoint working together in partnership. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and why that's so important as we think about setting up charging infrastructure at our truck stops. Sure, and thanks for the question. And you know, I I, I think that uh, what's most exciting about the partnership uh, that uh, Natso, ChargePoint, and and with all of Natso's member companies, you know, Trillium has been a great partner. Is that it, you know, it's almost like a, a romantic comedy, right? Who is the uh, partner in this industry that's been uh, you know seen and, and made that connection with? And increasingly, we're seeing folks enter into the market and offer EV charging. Um, in a way that, uh, you know, is exciting, uh, that uh, creates a significant opportunity uh, uh, and provides access to um, what the market is increasingly uh, demanding. So ChargePoint and Natso entered into uh, an agreement where uh, we'll be deploying a critical charging infrastructure at more than 4,000 travel plazas and fuel stops around the country. All right, this is ultimately going to enable long distance electric travel for any EV on the road. Um, and uh, it'll create a new uh, opportunity uh, to generate a business for travel plazas and fuel stop owners uh, alike. And so this is a commitment of a billion dollars 
uh, and it's a step in the right direction. Um, and there are many steps that are yet to come. Uh, but we think that it's really a recognition of um, uh, an increasing maturity of the market and an increasing uh, acceptance of, you know, uh, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, the drivetrain debate uh, uh, from ChargePoint's perspective is close to over, that EV is really uh, here. And, and we know that uh, folks uh, you know, are going to continue to offer many different fueling options. And we just see this as a fantastic recognition and partnership. One of the things that's really struck me about the partnership and about how we really get this to happen right uh, is 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 that big tent strategy that you know let's let's get multiple fuel options in there give people comfort and choice, uh, which is really what's been so interesting about the partnership I think that we've pulled together here and and working with all of you. One question I would have what, as you look at this, one of the justifications we've tried to make for federal and and, and public funding here is. You do have to, we can debate chicken or egg, but you do have to give comfort to users and get ahead of that curve by getting the fueling infrastructure out there. And, and maybe to give some help to like station operators and others who maybe can't make the investment based on the pure market today, but want to be ready for the market as it develops. It, how do you guys view that in terms of the need for public funding to kind of bridge this gap? Well, that's a great question. I'm happy to take a stab at it. I think one of the things that's most important is not to just view this issue as public funding to get the infrastructure out there. I think we have to think about this comprehensively. You have to be able to get the infrastructure in the ground, but you also have to be able to turn it on and keep it on. And so what we think is really important is when you do have incentive programs uh, to encourage uh, private investment uh, in uh, the construction and operation of EV charging stations, it needs to be flexible enough to address the specific issues that are uh, in front of um, owners and operators of charging stations from a capital perspective and an operating perspective. Mm -hmm. If you just install the stations and you don't address some of the challenges on the operating cost side, such as electricity rates that are going to be wildly different in uh, not just every state, but in every utility service territory, um, you're going to uh, ignore a significant challenge uh, in the economics. And so what's exciting about some of the incentive programs that we've been talking about earlier in the program uh, today is uh, there is flexibility to allow for uh, operating costs to be covered as well as capital costs, just so that we make sure that uh, we're not making too many assumptions about how those incentives have to be used. The market is really creative and we're going to come up with uh, fantastic mm -hmm. solutions and making sure that we're uh, allowing for that upfront is, uh, is critically important. David, Gavin, your, your thoughts on this? Gavin, do you want to go or do you want me to go? You go first, please. Uh, uh, okay. Um, I could see that in Gavin's eyes that he wanted you to go first, David. Fair enough. I work for Gavin, so if Gavin <laughs> go first, then, then go first, I shall. Um, so my perspective, and we we've lived through this with biofuels, mm -hmm. where there was a, a, a desire to get the private sector to invest in more dispensers that are compatible with higher biofuel blends than, than what was the case before. And my view with incentives like that is that I think ultimately they're a little silly because as a practical matter, if, if people want to buy an alternative fuel, our membership will invest in the means necessary to dispense that fuel and provide that fuel to customers, irrespective of whether there is a, 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 an incentive for them to do it. And conversely, if, if customers do not want to buy a particular fuel, no matter what the incentive program is, the membership by and large is not gonna have any interest in, in investing in something that their customers don't want. What I think we're seeing now is to your point with the chicken and the egg, I think that in order to get to where we need to be uh, in, in terms of, or where, where, where some folks want to be in terms of displacing petroleum-based fuel with, with electricity, um, there, you, you need to overcome the fact that that traditional economic approach to investment is, is just not where it needs to be right now. Um, so I think that, that policies that move uh, the, the needle in the right direction in terms of making the economics work um, are, are helpful. But, but, but I, I view those as somewhat of a peripheral concern to the more direct macro piece, which is how, what is the market governing 
the, these transactions going to look like? Um, what is the regulatory regime governing dispensing electricity into a vehicle going to look like? What is the role of utilities? Is there something that, that do my members conceivably, if you could snap your fingers and have every car on the road be electric tomorrow, would the rules of the road be such that, that my members can make money by selling electricity into vehicles? That, those larger questions to me are far more significant and over the long run will, will, will outweigh the relevance of, of, the, of the incentive programs that, that, are, that are designed to kind of keep things chugging along. But I think the larger regulatory debate to me is a more significant one that I spend more time on. Interesting point. Gavin, uh, just uh, any thoughts from you on this? You know, I think, uh, I, I think David raises a lot of really good points. And, you know, for us, uh, you know, it, 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 we, we view these things as, as standalone uh, opportunities, regardless of, of the fuel type, whether it's electric vehicles, CNG, biofuels, what have you. Uh, it always comes down to a matter of how much is it going to cost to put the infrastructure in the ground and to operate it? And, and what is the revenue that we can generate off of it? And, and how do we optimize the customer's experience to make sure uh, that we maximize the volume that, that, that are going through our, our various refueling uh, options? So, you know, the, the, the federal programs provide uh, an interesting input into those, uh, into those, those economic models that we mm -hmm. have to run. Uh, but, but from there, you know, it's a matter of how do they uh, back off to let the, the, the market uh, really create that, that optimal experience. Um, because I, I think David hits the nail right on the head. It's, it's incumbent upon us as infrastructure providers to make sure that the customer is paying what they will expect to pay and can afford to, to pay uh, across you know, a larger budget conversation, but then also is the refueling experience the, the optimal one for them. If it's too slow, if it takes too long, if there's too many moving parts that, that, that a customer has to kind of become a de facto engineer, it, it's not really gonna work for them. Uh, so we view it as sort of a standalone. I think that some government programs will help the introduction of that, but ultimately they're all gonna have to stand on their own. Yeah, so it's a jump start or a kickstart of kind of this initial launch and then start to shake out the regulatory and other issues that David was referring to so we can really get a seamless network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good replies and thank you for your good feedback there, you guys. We did receive a good question from our friend Abby Swain with EPA Region 1. And her question is around, so the Ozone Transportation Com Commission that's led by the state air agencies in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic region has made NOx a priority for emission reductions for heavy duty trucks. And she wanted to know just some good brainstorming that we could provide on what could a new network of truck charging infrastructure look like in the Ozone Transport Commission territory? I don't know if um, David or Kevin, maybe you want to take that good question of Abby's. I would sure. yield, Gavin. If I'm, go if I'm going first, I'm punting back to Gavin now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let them work that out. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin, have at it. Uh, yeah, happy to take a first crack at it. I, I think what's going to be important to note is that it's not going to be a simple and straightforward answer. Uh, I mentioned a kind of hub and spokes approach where we're going to mm -hmm. have to think about um, you know, the sort of order of operations for addressing infrastructure needs and uh, heavier duty uh, uh, transportation electrification needs. So, um, you know, in the same way that the light duty vehicle market evolved from a shorter range, uh, mostly urban uh, focused charging uh, to now significantly long distance, you know, cross country corridor charging. I think we're also going to see a, a working backwards from uh, more uh, urban uh, depot based uh, deployments uh, to support that, you know, last mile to last five miles to last 10 miles, we're working back to make sure that those infrastructure centers uh, um, are covered because a lot of fleets where we're going to see the most gains in this uh, uh, part of the market are going to be B depot uh, based uh, deployments by and large. Uh, but as um, you know, we rapidly see increases in battery technology. Um, you know, the lessons that we've learned, the underlying infrastructure investments that we've made and the regulatory pieces that we're going to be taking care of, particularly on the electricity rate structure where, you know, each and every uh, state jurisdiction is going to have to look at what are the structures of its electricity rates, you know, are they sufficient to allow 
these uh, types of fleets to electrify, because in many cases in the Northeast and in the Mid-Atlantic, that's not the case. It's something that we uh, engage with uh, significantly at the state public utility commission level. Uh, so, you know, there are some pieces uh, that are going to have to be uh, worked out um, uh, at, uh, at that top regulatory structure, uh, but, you know, uh, working on both the hubs and the spokes, um, you know, at the appropriate time is, is uh, uh, going to be necessary uh, to, to get those NOx emission reduction goals um, in the OTC. Now I can piggyback off Kevin, and that's so much easier than starting the conversation. So thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, you know, the only thing I'd add is, you know, if, if the priority is NOx emissions, don't pick one technology and stick to it. Just keep your mind on it, it, if NOx emissions are the priority, then make that the, the, the measuring stick. Uh, there's, there's an awful lot of, of different vehicle technologies uh, that, that, that do provide NOx reductions. Uh, so set the NOx reductions and let, let, let the market figure it out. You know, infrastructure for, for charging is, is certainly a great avenue for that, as is deploying uh, more of the, the, the modern uh, compressed natural gas vehicles that we see on the road uh, as, as well. Obviously, that deployment is considerably different than uh, the, the very cogent response that Kevin just gave on the electrification piece of it. Um, but I would just, you know, just make sure that you keep the goal in mind if you're outlining a program to, to, to reach that goal. I think that was actually a really interesting observation because as part of our Global Drive to Zero program, there is a clear acknowledgement, as Kevin really pointed out, that electrification is really starting best in urban uh, return to base duty cycles. And eventually we'll get into corridors. And eventually, we're talking 2025, we're seeing the, this capability. But there's multiple solutions that you need to support in parallel. It isn't a one solution option out there. And for a lot of the corridor work right now, there are some ultra low NOx engines that could really be good fits as part of a package of solutions. So I think that's really a good observation. Right, and I know that we have, David, just for a few more minutes. Um, so David, I might turn to you with a question and then we'll be wrapping up shortly. Uh, so David, I, I know before you go, would love to get your thoughts on what are some innovative strategies that you all are thinking about as you're working with your members to think about how to advance alternative fuels at their truck stops um, or at their commercial centers. Um, what are some really innovative ideas that you're thinking about that we should be thinking about as well and how we can be helping you? You gave me a tough one on the way out. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, probably, to be honest, the, the most in, innovative idea I think we've had is to, is to initiate the partnership with ChargePoint. Um, I, I think a lot of that came simply from the fact that uh, there are so many incentives out there that, that I simply do not have the bandwidth to be able to offer my membership the type of um, guidance and expertise that they need in order to fully and effectively navigate those and take advantage of those. Um, and I found that ChargePoint, more than any other um, company out there, uh, is aligned with our membership in terms of what the big picture governance structure of this space should look like. Uh, so I basically agreed with ChargePoint that when, when there are opportunities that I should be aware of or that our members should be aware of, tell me. Um, and I will put them in touch with any member of mine in whatever state where there's an incentive program coming um, so that they can effectively take advantage of it. Uh, so I, I think, you know, I remember this again, are, are generally don't push for one or another type of fuel, but they want to be nimble enough and prepared enough to kind of adjust to the, to the market um, and, and move in the direction that, that things seem to be moving. Um, and ChargePoint ha has done a, a nice job um, uh, help, helping me look good by, by having our members be aware of this. I hate complimenting Kevin when he can hear me. I, I much prefer to... <laughs> I don't know if you can tell how smug I look through webcam. It usually that that comes across pretty clearly in person. But I, you know, it's just it's been. You fantastic could tell, Kevin. How, you you oh, could tell. Good. Fantastic, Bill. Well, then yeah, message sent. So you know. Message uh, intended was message received. I mean, I, I think we're we're seeing so much openness to these solutions across the board in the fueling convenience industry because they make sense right now, right? So we're seeing that uh, the dollars and cents are penciling out. 
we're seeing increased demand uh, for people who want to plug in. Uh, so it's not a question of proselytizing, it's a question of planning. And that's a problem that we can overcome. This is something that we can readily accomplish. And so it's been great to have such fantastic partnerships with Natso and with Trillium, um, readily address some of these opportunities um, ahead of us. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, David. Thank you, Gavin. You guys are truly great. And I really appreciate you being a part of our program today. We've learned so much from you. And I wanna just let, our participants know that this is recorded and we are going to make this available on our YouTube channel as well as on LinkedIn and on our landing page on our CalSTART website. So please know that this will be available for all to see. Just want to remind folks if you're interested in learning more about our federal federal policy campaign on securing federal funding for alternative fuel corridors, please feel free to reach out to us. We would love to engage your support on that. We do want to see how we can support bringing in some significant funding for infrastructure to advance alternative fuel corridors. I want to thank you three for being a part of that and supporting us and really appreciate everyone joining us today for this important conversation and appreciate your help in advancing alternative fuel corridors. And Bill, I think we'll close it up for today. That makes sense to me. So thanks, uh, everybody, for taking part in the update and the update extra. Uh, as Alicia said, see it online, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye.